InfoSec Skills is releasing a new free challenge every month with three hands-on labs to put your cyber skills to the test. It's November, and with the colder weather and shorter days coming, we're burrowing deep into insecure networks to practice with the tools and techniques used by expert penetration testers worldwide. Challenge one, you'll get authentic hands-on experience using a variety of vulnerability scanning tools, the same type of tools that pen testers use to expedite processes so they can focus on target-specific tasks. Challenge two, you'll leverage a client-side code injection attack to take over a victim's browser. And for your top-level challenge, you'll enter our purple team cyber range to exploit local files and perform remote code execution. Complete all three challenges, download your certificate of completion, upload it to in LinkedIn, and tag InfoSec for your chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card, an InfoSec hoodie, and a one-year subscription to InfoSec Skills so you can keep on learning. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash challenge and kickstart your cybersecurity skills today. Today on CyberWork, we welcome Cicero Chimbanda, InfoSec Skills author and lecturer, to discuss his cybersecurity leadership and management course on skills. We discuss the many paths of a cybersecurity leadership role, the soft skills that separate good information security managers from great ones, and why a baseline of cybersecurity knowledge can enhance any job, even if you don't plan to pivot into the industry. That's all coming up today on CyberWork. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, and offer tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Cicero Chimbanda has over 25 years of experience in information technology and cyber risk management. He currently serves as Senior Vice President for an investment bank responsible for information technology, cybersecurity risk management, and he co-chairs the firm's Cybersecurity Task Force. He also serves as a college instructor and is a content author for InfoSec Skills. Uh, he has a CISM, Certified Information Security Manager uh, certification, a CIPM, Certified International Program Manager, and is Disaster Recovery Business Continuity Professional Certified. That's a BCPDR. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science in Information Systems from DePaul University and is completing a Master's Jurisprudence at DePaul Law School. Uh, he's also the founder of CVC Ventures LLC, a STEM and cyber development practice. So because our free monthly uh, skills challenges are ramping up in popularity, uh, thank you all for people who've been uh, checking them out, playing the games and sending them to our LinkedIn. We love seeing it. Uh, so we're inviting some of our skills authors onto the podcast to talk about some of their areas of expertise, where their passion comes from in these subjects, uh, and what they've learned about the specific benefit of online skills-based learning. So uh, Cicero has written a skills learning path on cybersecurity leadership and management. Uh, we had some recent episodes with other skills authors talking about uh, starting level knowledge areas, including Jasmine Jackson, talking about Linux fundamentals, and Chris Thorson on secure coding, and Ted Harrington on AppSec. Uh, so now I'm looking forward to talking with Cicero about what there is to be learned about leadership roles and how InfoSec skills can play a part in that education. So Cicero, welcome to CyberWork. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I'd like to start the show by uh, giving our listeners a sense of your background. So where did you first get interested in computers and tech? Uh, and when specifically did you get excited about cybersecurity? What was the initial attraction? Wow. So uh, at t that takes me back, Chris. Um, you know, yeah. my father, actually, he... Um, he was in the in the computer science career. Mm -hmm. uh, he worked as a uh, mainframe developer. Um, he actually did assembly and COBOL back in the oh. mainframe world. Yeah. And uh, I remember um, as a young uh, middle schooler, I believe, uh, he took me to a career day, a shadow, you know, father's mm -hmm. shadow. And... Um, and so I was responsible at that time. I remember carrying punch cards. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you remember those punch cards. Oh, yeah. uh, they're, they're stiff paper with digital data represented. It. You know, you got holes. And so I used to carry that from the, the programmer to the, the individuals that's putting that, inputting that. Okay. I also remember carrying, you know, big blocks of paper, you know, those prints. So that was my, my introduction to computers, IBM 1403. Also, mm -hmm. I, I remember getting a computer when I was a young kid, uh, VIC 20. 
Oh yeah. Comod- yeah, yeah. Commodore Commodore 64, ring a bell those Yeah, those little- I, 64 was my first computer too. Yeah, we're about the same age, I think. Yeah, they yes. 20 a little before me even, but yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. So I I remember yeah. uh you know, playing the games, but also being interested to do programming. So mm-hmm. you could write a little code. And I remember writing my first program at middle school. It was a elements table. It was, mm. uh, you know, it was, it was just an yeah. if then else sta- statement. Um, you know, if A equals H, then B equals hydrogen. You know, you just kind of yeah. link very simple, you know, simplistic. And if you go, if, if A equals uh, H2 and B equals, you know, O, then uh, then C equals water. You know, you kind of, mm-hmm. you know, you, you link the elements. So, uh, and with that, uh, when I enrolled in college, um, I ended up going into cyber, into computer science mm-hmm. and, um, and that really launched my career. Now, shifting over to cybersecurity, it really, it, it became more of a, uh, cut the writing on the wall. You, you can mm. see that um, uh, uh, cybersecurity issues were becoming larger than technology issues. Okay. It was really a business issue. You know, it's, it's, it was outside. And, and so with that, um, I wanted to get myself uh, the, the acumen there. And, mm-hmm. and so then I jumped over to that side of the fence. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so what year would that have been when you, when you decided that cybersecurity was getting too big to ignore? That was uh, right after the, uh, the crash, the market crash around mm-hmm. 2008, 2009. Yes. Gotcha. Um, okay. You could just, you could just see the writing of the wall that uh, mm-hmm. computer related risks were big, right? So yes. you can have an event that can literally crash a whole market. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, um, what was when you, as you were looking into this, what were the first sort of steps you took towards learning about this? I mean, it's one thing to say like, oh yeah, like cybersecurity is too big to ignore. Like, did you have some experience of this to this point? And if not, like, what did you, what, what did you start reading first? Were you reading about like system security or pen testing or malware or reverse engineering or what have you? Sure. It really, I did, I, the exposure of security that I had up to that point was really building uh, application software in a secure fashion. So mm-hmm. the, account, the accountability and, and the oversight of cy- cybersecurity controls were not in place. But because of that, um, I ended up really, it was more individually reading, uh, mm-hmm. going to webinars, going to uh, asking my employer at the time if I could, uh, you know, go to certain, you know, uh, uh, conferences. I remember going to the RSA conference uh, early on and in and, and, and San Francisco. So that was a big exposure yeah. um, of Cypher. And, and so that helped me propel me uh, to take some courses and eventually getting certified as a security professional. Okay, so I had a question, and I think you, you're sort of answering it here, but I want to sort of dig in a little bit deeper. So uh, looking at your past jobs, I saw there's a pretty big jump in job title and responsibility from around that time, 2007 to 2009. So you spent two of these years working in program management slash project management. Uh, and then in 2009, you became the director of technology, certified information security manager responsible for the strategic planning and execution of the uh, bank that you are uh, currently at. Um, So what skills or experiences did you take from your previous employment that helped you make this big uh, career step? And and how has the scope of your work changed in this current role? Because you've been there for a long time, it sounds like. Sure. Yeah, you know, I I have to really, when I look back, um, you know, and again, digging back and thinking how that pivot happens, uh, it really started with a mentorship. You know, oh, really? I, I had a mentor uh, that, um, you know, he, he, I don't even mind mentioning his name. His name was Frank Clark. He was the, he was mm-hmm. the president of Commonwealth Edison. I oh, used to yes. work at ComEd early on. Okay. And he, he mentioned to me, he said, Cicero, in order for you to move up to the leadership ranks, which is what one of my goals was, I wanted to go into leadership. Mm-hmm. He said, you have to build your soft skills, right? So he encouraged me and said, you know, maybe with your technical skills, maybe getting an MBA, maybe going into a legal field, maybe finance. Yep. Um, I tried to dabble a little bit in the legal side because I always wanted to go to uh, to law school, but I just got married. I just had a little baby. Mm-hmm. So it was too much to muster. So, yeah. but because I was getting interested in investments and getting interested in finance for my own personal, you know, my own personal need, mm-hmm. um, I had another mentor that jumped in. He said, Cicero, why don't you think about getting certified, getting your security 
Uh, and so I ended up getting my series six, 63, 626. These are all producers, financial producers, life and health. And I actually ran my own business consulting business while I was doing that mm. project management and program manager. So I was kind of doing a double, double shift. I was running my own yeah. practice and I was doing uh, working at the bank. And, uh, and what that did for me, it really built my confidence once to that soft skills of, of interfacing clients and business and being able to take complex issues and presenting it in a way that's palatable to non-technical people. Um, and then um, obviously that also helped me uh, get into the finance investment banking because I knew the language yep. as a director and a, uh, um, you know, as a manager. So that's what helped propel me. Great. Uh, yeah, you're not, uh, my next question is about uh, certs and specifically about the CISM or the Certified Information Security Manager certification. Uh, can you tell me about the type of learning and study that you needed to perform to achieve that certification? Yeah, so the CHISM, the, I, th I think that is a, a it's a great um certification. It's one it's one of the hardest ones. I've taken several yeah. uh, exams, uh, both technical and non-technical, uh, but it, it, it has a five year prerequisite of experience, first okay. of all. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't just take the test. You have to prove that you have certain hours within your field. Okay. Uh, they do, they do check that, validate that with, with your managers and coworkers and whatnot. That test itself is four hours and 150 questions. So, um, it's a, it's a long longevity there. Um, you, you need to have minimum of certain project hours. I don't quite remember how many hours were. I, I know the PMP was about 7,500 hours. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it really, what I did for me was I had to communicate to my loved ones, uh, the people that I, um, you know, influence, responsible for, that, you know, I am taking a focused approach you know, and this is important for my career. So, right. um, you know, and even at the time I was battling some health issues. So it, it, it really had to be a, a kind of a, a, a spearheading of 10 to 15 hours a week outside my work hours to, to take that test. Yeah. Um, and, but what it did for me, uh, Chris, it really shifted my perspective on what cybersecurity in the corporate world is all about. Uh, again, it shifted from saying, you know, it's not a technical uh, IT issue. It's really a governance issue. Okay? okay. It starts, it starts at the corporate governance and leadership. And if the if the board if of a publicly held company is not on board with cybersecurity, they don't, they're not getting any KPIs, then they're not going to hold the company ac accountable. If the CEO if the CFO, if all those business units are not there, then it becomes a challenge. So that's part of the what I got out of uh, taking that Chisholm uh, mm -hmm. back in the day. Now, can I talk? Can I ask you a little bit about um, actual? Because you uh, you just said something, and this just put me on a tangent here. But uh, do you feel that there is even a technical requirement necessary? to do Chisholm the way that you did it? Because it almost sounds like something where if you want to be the person who's in charge of the information security and the management of that in your company, but you're coming to it from a different sort of C-suite direction, that this is almost as, as applicable there. Or do you, or is there still a, a baseline tech knowledge that you need um, to do that? Yes. And I always say career, in, when the technology, there's always uh, the two tracks, right? You got mm -hmm. depth and you got breadth. And um, what I mean by depth is, uh, as you know, is, is what we call in our industry SMEs, subject matter experts. Yes. And when you have a subject matter expert, they're typically you can only be a subject matter expert of one, maybe two, potentially three things. Um, and so you're going deep into that realm. You become a subject matter expert where you're a developer or a firewall or a perimeter protection yeah. coding. So but you can also build your career, not necessarily on the depth track, but on the breadth track where you understand, uh, uh, you know, a good knowledge of each component. But the key is being able to connect the dots between those mm -hmm. uh, those levels. So you're able to connect and see how a firewall perimeter protection is important, just like a developer controls, just like and on a host controls. I would say I was more at that breadth level. Okay. So I understood technology 
at various points, but I, I wouldn't consider myself a subject matter expert. And right. so that's what I would say for individuals. If you want to, you can move from a track from a subject matter expert and become a manager and be have that one or two things that you are, you have that uh, uh, competitive advantage or influence, yep. or you could be somebody who has a breath um, and understands high level uh, in some low level, but you're able to connect the dots. That's the most important thing. Gotcha. And you're able to have managerial and good people skills. Uh, so what are your thoughts in general on certification and, and cert study? Because uh, we get a wide range of answers here from guests ranging from, you know, it's unimportant as long as you can demonstrate your skills in a hiring situation over to completely crucial in all aspects of the job. Where do you see certs as fitting into the modern cybersecurity landscape, especially uh, as regards, you know, attempting to rapidly upskill uh, and place people in cybersecurity amidst our uh, skills gap? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely you hit that right in the nail. The, the jobs are much greater than the candidates. And, and I'm, mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing that in our industry. Uh, but certifications is really a good um, confidence builder uh, because what it does, it, it provides you with knowledge where you can get it at a, at a shorter period of time, obviously, than a traditional, uh, you know, um, a degree, if you will. Uh, uh, and the other thing, really, what it allows you to do, um, it really, it's all about um, taking the time, the effort, mm -hmm. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, communicating to the individuals around you and and what it does for you, it gives you the ability to pivot, right? Uh, pivot even, even, either from within your industry, OK, or your position. For example, if you want to go from an analyst to an administrator or to somebody who manages administrators, you could take certifications and then pivot and get that upward a career. Or if you want to do a lateral, you know, if you're in a completely different industry and but you're you you want to do it in a way that's safe for you. In other words, you don't want to lose your job. You want to still work. You want to you know, it's not going to cost you a lot of money so you can get that cert to help you um, make a lateral movement um, mm -hmm. and within your specific industry and then transition out once you get that cert. And, and that leads me to the second point from employer's perspective, when you have a certification, it helps, you know, it's an attention getter. If I see yeah. somebody has a Chisholm, they have a comp, comp, comp you know, a, a health, uh, a healthical hacker. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have, uh, you know, a, a security plus or, uh, you know, a Cisco a certification, then that candidate is going to go up, uh, yeah. you know, my, my ladder, uh, when I bring him into the fourth, uh, to the front door, um, gives you a competitive advantage when you come in, but you still have to dif differentiate yourself. You yeah. still have to show why yeah. you're the best candidate for that position. So right. that's what I would say. Yeah. And that often comes down to uh, projects that you've completed outside of a cert or other things you can show on your resume, like uh, other soft skills or other areas of inquiry or research or blog writing or what have you. Absolutely. And, and you yeah. know, and, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about this, but a lot of it is just you can even uh, if you don't have a lot of those skill sets in professional way, mm -hmm. you can volunteer. Yes. Volunteerism is a great way of you building your 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 resume with application of knowledge. Yep. You know, you volunteer at an education institution or community uh, and you're helping individuals apply your knowledge and you can put that in your resume. Yeah. And and you're you're helping out people who may not have, uh, you know, money or resources, but really need, you know, we, we hear so much about all the sort of uh, regional infrastructure that's so badly uh, secured and, and you know, the, the, the water hack in Florida and things like that. So, uh, you know, it seems like there's so many places that you could, you know, throw your hat in the ring and then also have something you can say I you can point to a thing that you specifically did that shows that you know how to do that thing. Absolutely, Chris. Uh, so um, can you tell me about your work as uh, a college lecturer? What, what classes or topics do you teach? And as someone who, like all educators, has had to make changes during the current pandemic, have you seen this type of education change over the past 20 months? Sure. Um, you know, if we talk about careers and I think careers are always, uh, you know, metamorphosis. You know, you're always uh, as an individual, you want to, mod you know, modify yourself to meet that ultimate goal. What I did about five years ago, I, I shifted my profession to want to be an educator, not just apply. And so city colleges um, gave me an opportunity. They were looking to hire uh, industry professionals 
to teach courses in what they actually do. Right. And so we, I came on the early end of it and we actually developed a cybersecurity course for city colleges uh, okay. with the help of uh, other uh, academics and other professionals. And so uh, what we do teach is we partner up with CompTIA, which is a well-respected cybersecurity certification um, uh, course. And uh, we built that course with Security Plus, Network Plus. Um, and, uh, and now I teach that course, but we do it in a different manner. We really think okay. of three tracks, right? So when it comes to uh, the students, we, we believe in getting that knowledge and, and teaching the student to be successful in passing those exams. Number two, we give lots and lots of on, hands-on learning. We believe in labs. So labs yeah. is, a, is, a, is a strong component. So individuals can have that technical confidence of applying what they learn in lab environments. And, and you're, it's easy to do with, with cloud computing now. Yep. And then lastly, it's really the career focus. So we focused on what are the industry careers out there, positions in the different industries. And we help the students even do what's called reverse engineer their career, their optimal oh, career, okay. mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we expose them to different, uh, uh, you know, professionals. They come in and teach and talk about what they do. And, uh, and so that career soft skills, real life business use case is the third track of success. Okay. Um, now, is City Colleges back to doing in-person learning or is this all virtual or has it always been virtual? Yes. And that that goes to the latter question that you mentioned. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. We actually started doing a hybrid model before the pandemic. Okay. And uh, and and so when pandemic hit, we just went fully uh, virtual. Right. And uh, so that was not a problem. Now, this cohort, I'm actually in the cohort, is where I would say two thirds virtual and then one third where where we coming in on Saturdays to do some labs and the students can meet okay. each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's that is changed, right? Mm -hmm. What has changed is the students have to be, we're also teaching students how to be more professional on video, virtual classroom, uh, being able to have the right lighting, the right mic, you know, that type oh, of, yeah. you know, turning on your, your video when you're talking. Yeah. Um, and then um, also the other thing is the students are now in multiple portals, you know, because you're virtual, you know, so you're having to have homework in this portal, having to, you know, do the video and the, and the recording. So yeah. it, we're trying to consolidate and make it one, you know, one stop shop, but it, it is a challenge because the yeah. students have to keep up with all the different portals in order to just take one course. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say just to, uh, just to take a class these days, everyone has to be a project manager because you're, <laughs> you're dealing with so many inputs right now. Yes. And, and then also just uh, as an instructor, you have to remember, especially in a five hour class to have a lot, lots of breaks. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Burnout is real for sure. Um, so can we speak about, uh, soft skills a little bit? What are, what are some skills that people uh, do you think are overlooking in their studies and preparation in cybersecurity? So I think, you know, a lot of people get intimidated when they think of cybersecurity and they mm -hmm. automatically associate with, you know, am I, I'm not a coder, you know, right. I'm not in robotics, you know, yep. I don't know AI, artificial intelligence, you know, mm -hmm. our, uh, and so they you hear a lot of the buzzwords that's in the, out there and some people might uh, be intimidated and think that they're not really uh, adequate to go into that right. field. And I would say, uh, yeah, you know, it is important to have those skills. Certainly it gives you a competitive advantage, but there are so many aspects of cybersecurity that you can fit your career without being a sort of certain so subject matter expert in a technical side. So the soft skills, for example, what I would say is even having what I call bridging the gap capabilities, bridging the gap between cybersecurity technology and the business. There's a lot of people that don't really know in cybersecurity technology talk business. And there's a lot of business individuals that don't know how to talk cybersecurity technology. Yes. If, so if you can place yourself in the middle there, that is in a competitive advantage that's really needed today, Chris, because it is going into the business, you know, cybersecurity yes. is going. And so they're looking for individuals that can be able to communicate, uh, can be able to negotiate, prioritize, can be able to, um, you know, um, uh, talk about 
processes and procedures, project management that you talked about, a, a manage a person who can manage the life cycles of delivery of controls for security, for example, mm-hmm. training. If you're a good trainer, you know, a user yeah. awareness is huge. You know, they need individuals that can train. So those yeah. are some of the soft skills. And um, and then I, I just call them connecting the dots, you know, for, for example, uh, I'll just give you an example. If you're a nurse, uh, or med tech in, in a hospital, you know a lot about the procedures and life cycles to deliver successful um, results for your role. Now, yep. couple, couple that with cybersecurity knowledge. In other words, being able to understand, you know, uh, if I'm in that role, how can I protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of that patient? Right. If I understand who are the threat actors in the healthcare and what kind of techniques do they use for yeah. healthcare? Wow, yeah. uh, what are the technical controls and administrative controls and physical controls in a healthcare environment? So a nurse or a med tech can make a very easy uh, jump to be a cybersecurity professional because they already have that acumen. That soft yeah. skill. So uh, I call them connecting the dots. Those are some of the skills, um, along with being an influencer, um, you know, to your peers and upward management. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard that said specifically in in that way on the show. So I think that's that that can't be. I, I want to really like go into that. And not only I think if, if you're in healthcare, for instance, and you understand cybersecurity, but you're still a nurse, like you're still providing extra value in your own position as well. Like it, it behooves you, even if you don't plan to make the jump to cybersecurity, I imagine, to at least understand it and be able to contribute and say, like you said, I know what the threat actors are. I know why are, you know, and you can make the case to your hospital. I need, we need to secure this medical data. And, and, it, and then that just sort of speaks to the sort of a security mindset across, you know, the entire society. Absolutely. You know, and my mom was actually a nurse uh, mm-hmm. in profession. And I remember uh, one instance that she had where she was able to uh, notice that a doctor was actually uh, wanting to operate on a patient on a wrong leg. Oh, you God. know, they used to use they used to mm-hmm. use marking, you know, they used to use uh, pen marker, marking. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. And 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 like, apparently somebody had uh, he had marked the wrong leg. And so he when he was going to go open, <sighs> my mom actually caught the hand and said, no, it's the other non-mark because she followed it. Now, that's a that's a serious mistake. Now, so you think about cybersecurity. If you're a nurse and you're you have cybersecurity acumen, you can understand vulnerabilities. You yep. can understand where the uh, you know where 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 there's risk, high risk. You can communicate that, and you literally can help add value to whatever profession you're doing, without like you saying necessarily making that jump to be a cybersecurity professional. Yeah. Uh, so um, let's talk. Let's talk leadership. Now, the main topic of our discussion today is your InfoSec skills learning path, uh, which is titled cybersecurity leadership and management. Uh, so for listeners who are currently subscribers or who maybe even, you know, describe decide to subscribe to skills based on today's episode, uh, what will they learn from your cybersecurity leadership and management class? So I think the the first thing I, I really want to stress is is what I've been talking about in the theme of cybersecurity is not a technical issue, um, it really is a business uh, issue. It's a business risk. In this course, we 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 do a lot uh, in communicating to the candidate or professional or student um, to to, to uh, learn alignment, bridging the gap. Okay, and building those skill sets. Uh, for example, uh, we use a lot of uh, uh, business models uh, mm-hmm. to uh, convey the importance of cybersecurity controls. So, in other words, your controls are fitting into the business models in order to achieve the business outcomes, right? Because yep. that's really is the end in mind. Uh, I give an example. Um, you know, we all know the three pillars of cybersecurity: CIA, triad, right? Yep. Uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, so we use, for example, the STS model, which is the security, trust, availability. Uh, so you take security, you understand the organization's strategy, and then you bring in confidentiality, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, you take a trust right, which is the second pillar of the STS model, you take trust, you try to understand what are the regulatory systems. For example, what are we regulated by? Because all, whether you're a small mom, pop, 
or a big, you know, organization, you have to abide through to some laws. Yep. It's behooves of a security professional to understand what are the statutes, the legal, the regulations. And so we talk a lot about that, the alignment so that you can bring integrity, okay, mm -hmm. into the uh, organization. And then lastly, stability, right? We all know lights has got to be kept on, right? Uh, you have to, you know, fulfill your commitments. You have to, you know, that's how you get reoccurring business. You have to be stable. And that's where you meet your operational demand, okay? And availability is a big component to that. So we talk a lot about alignment. Uh, the course itself has two learning paths. Okay. One path is leadership, where we talk about governance, senior business models. And then the second path is management. And that's how do you deliver the controls? How do you communicate? Okay. What are the goals? And it's a little bit more technical, but it still keeps it at a high level to help you, um, you know, manage people who are technical, because you might not be the technical yes. person, but okay. you need to manage the technical people. Yeah. Can you, uh, we don't have to go through your entire syllabus, but can you sort of tell me what what the main sort of concepts you're 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 working with in these two tracks, like especially, sure. the, especially, so, the, especially the management one. I'm I'm very curious about the sort of like working with technical people aspect of that. Right, right. So mm -hmm. so in the management one, we we look at the we break it down into you know there are many types of controls, but we have physical controls, and within physical controls, we'll talk a lot about, for example, you know, uh, data center SOC. Uh, you know, we talk about perimeter protection, physical, the, um, you know, how to protect the, the depending on what industry, uh, making sure that you are aligned with your physical structure in security. And even talk about events such as disaster, uh, you know, natural uh, uh, events that can, you know, that can uh, interrupt your physical domain, right? And people's people's um, physical security. So that's one. And then we talk about technical controls. So we focus on things like hosts, uh, zero day, um, you know, uh, appliances, firewall, next generation okay. firewalls. We talk about I IAM, um, identity, IAM, identity access management controls, how to uh, make sure you're protecting your uh, passwords and, you know, multi-factor authentication. So we delve in deep into that. And then we talk also about, uh, for example, um, your uh, administrative controls, uh, programs such as patch management programs, uh, BCP, business continuity and disaster recovery. Those are those are processes. You know, they're, they're bringing together. It's a program. It's a project. So we talk a lot about that. User awareness training. We, we delve in and user awareness. Uh, we talk about, um, you know, pen testing, vulnerability assessment. Those are all programs. Yeah. So that's where we delve in and how to be able to deliver those components. Uh, so once students have taken and passed your your skills path, what are some some next directions that you would recommend for their study? Where 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 should they they move on from from the sort of security leadership? Is this something that uh, is there like a next level up, or is are you sort of like preparing them for for the top level there? Yeah, you know, it could be either or, really, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I, I'd say you know it, the the course itself is 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 uh, is acumen enough to give confidence for somebody to say, okay, maybe I want to go into um, a different, in the same position, but a different career, a uh, different industry. Uh, because in cybersecurity, you have the ability to choose your industry. Uh, so in other words, let's say, because I always believe if you're going to do something, do it with a um, with the industry that you are passionate about. Mm -hmm. So if you're passionate about, let's say, the governance, and you want to go into mm -hmm. the government sector, then uh, choose your industry. You know what mm -hmm. interests you. Uh, you know because cybersecurity fits any vertical. Um, yep. If you want to go into finance, you know you can target that. If you want to go to a, a private sector or public sector, if you want to go into sports and entertainment, because they need cybersecurity. Oh, yeah. So you literally take a step back and evaluate what industry do I want to practice my cybersecurity professional acumen? Because that mm -hmm. will give you a leg up because you're interested in it and you're going to be good at it. Right. Yeah. So that's the first step. The next one is find a mentor, find a partner, start networking. 
Because really, I believe in reverse engineering careers. So mm-hmm. if you network with a CISO, for example, and you want to do it, you want to become the CISO of uh, NBA, you find yourself uh, a CISO of, of NBA, the current one, mm-hmm. you write them, you, you know, you go to sports conventions or whatever, and you, you, you network there, and then you can literally find out how they got there, and then you can you can, um, you know, uh, strategize your, your steps to take in, in the way that that individual took. And then the last step, I would just say, take a chance, implement what you've learned. OK, apply your knowledge, uh, update your resume, apply for positions. You might think you're not qualified, but I tell you, a lot of the industries like myself, I'm looking for quick learners, individuals that can pivot individuals that can deliver, individuals that have good soft skills, and they're willing to learn the tactical skills. I'd rather mold you than uh, in the technical side, you know, because you have a lot of industry knowledge, um, depending on what role, of course, you're taking, right? Right. And then also you can volunteer if you're not able to get jobs. Uh, Volunteer, volunteer to your local community. So, uh, so, so speaking from a, a strictly, a, a, we talked a little bit about soft skills before, but f- uh, in, in the leadership role, what do you think are some soft skills and a- attributes that uh, separates a good cybersecurity manager from a great one? Yeah, so um, I think the analytical, uh, being a person who's very analytical, uh, weighs pros and cons. You know, I always like to talk about matrices, uh, you know, having the ability to have multiple ways of weighing things. You know, think about Gardner and the foresters of the world. They rank. And so because as a, as a leader in a cybersecurity profession, you're not really making decisions for the business units. You're giving them options and you're, and you're giving them the pros and cons and the impacts, the likelihood of choosing a specific choice, right? And then, and and so being able to be analytical and present and also influence, right? Because you have to be able to communicate in such a way that you're negotiating, right? And and the skill set there is being a great listener, uh, being able to be a, a understanding. Uh, uh, being able to uh, allow individuals to to put it, present to them their goals, right? What are their, the business unit's goals? What are their challenges, right? And then translating that into win-win scenarios, being able to negotiate, being diplomatic uh, is a skill set, right? Mm-hmm. And then lastly, uh, you want to be able to um, be able to influence with uh, uh, and and take responsibility, right? Because uh, ownership is the importance. You can't point your finger anywhere else if something goes wrong, right? Uh, That's that's, that's the main important thing of a leader. You take ownership because if you own it, you're gonna go to it and you're gonna make everything, uh, you're gonna do your best to make sure you have the necessary resources to achieve the goals that you're, you're trying to achieve. All right, so Cicero, so you 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 have worked in education from a, di- a number of different directions. You're a you're a lecturer, and you also work on infosec skills. Can you talk about some benefits to skills based education and training uh, that people might not be aware of? You know, obviously, not everyone has the time or re- resources to you know do college courses. But can you talk about uh, what you what you saw in infosec skills that made you want to uh, do this work, and why you think it's a specifically um, why it's specifically useful to different different users? Yes, um, I think of uh, you know rapid the depo- the delivery right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with again formal long term educations, you, it takes you a little while to implement your le- your learning. Right. With with uh, this skill based education, you can implement what you're learning real time, literally. Uh, if when when you do a chapter, for example, when we talk about onboarding. Uh, employees and offboarding, the importance, and that's a subsection of IAM, identity access management. And if you are in HR and you're taking this course, you literally can implement some of those controls right away as you take this course, you know, yeah. uh, some of those acumens. So that's the ip- instant application. That's one of the advantage. Um, you know, a lot of skill base uh, is you can, um, you can also apply it to, uh, you know, educate your family, friends, you can practice yep. what you're learning. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a huge gap in, in, in senior uh, elders being attacked with cybersecurity oh, yeah. um, and they need education. They need how to be able to not to be, you know, scammed. So yeah. I, I actually have encouraged uh, one of my students, and this is another uh, domain to go and volunteer 
at a senior's home to teach them how to watch out for scams. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, that's a huge need. Or parents at schools, right? Mm -hmm. Teenagers. Um, the other thing advantage is it's, it's a minimized risk of transition. You can still stay employed and do what you're doing, and you can take the skill-based education while you're still employed. It's, it's kind right. of a soft way of transitioning. Yep. And obviously the last one, the cost is lower, right? So it's, right. it's you know, you have a lot uh, that that's one of the, also the advantages. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that leads nicely into my next question. Uh, obviously with uh, one of the benefits of skills is that you can, you have this open-ended schedule. You can do it when you have time. Like you said, you can put 10 hours aside a week. Uh, unfortunately, the downside of that is I think we know with human nature is that without a professor assigning weekly tasks, uh, it can be hard to stay on track to meet your learning objectives. Do you have any tips to help lifelong learners stay focused on training and uh, accomplish their goals? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'll put one, my risk assessment hat and, and uh, you have in life planned events. And in life, you have unplanned events. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're doing something like a transition or planning for a transition, it's actually good to plan for both. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so in your planning, uh, you know, you always want to say, you know, this is my ideal schedule to get this accomplished. But you know what? There's going to be some unplanned events. Yeah. There's going to be things that are I'm not I'm not even thinking about that's going to happen. And so yeah. you actually bank into your schedule. Uh, some unplanned events that you not, might not even know about at that time. So in this in this uh, course, I would say, you know, it's two tracks. If you break it down into, you know, either a month or two per track, depending on your, you know, on your life stage, and then uh, break down each subtopic and, and plan it in your calendar, but always have buffers for, like I said, unplanned event. And, uh, but again, the key is always to be consistent and, uh, and also tell your loved ones, you know, Hey, I got to do this being able, cause yeah. when you say, when you, and this is one of the mindsets, when you say no to something, it means you're saying yes to something else. Yep. So don't feel like, you know, Hey, if I say no to, you know, that particular event, social event, or even a family event, it, 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 what you're communicating is it's, I'm saying yes to a future of my career. So that's that's yep. one of the principles. That's great. Uh, so do you have any other uh, skills learning paths on the horizon that you're working on? And, and if not, do you have any other areas of learning that you'd want to teach someday? Uh, well, I mean, right now, um, I, I don't have any right now. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually in the middle of teaching a cohort. I have about 20 students at the city okay. colleges. So that's what mm -hmm. I'm doing. That finishes uh, Q1 2022. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also helping my father. He just finished the book, uh, mm, you know, wow. during the during the pandemic, he wrote a book and he's uh, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, my dad is a great influencer. Mm -hmm. And uh, and not only is he finished the book, he also opened a scholarship foundation wow. where he's, hel he's helping children in uh, Africa mm -hmm. get scholarships. So I'm helping my dad with that. Oh, that's, uh, so great. Th that's one of my thing, but future, mm -hmm. um, I do hope to, to, you know, implement uh, cybersecurity, uh, bring it at a lower level. I really believe you can introduce cybersecurity acumen to middle schoolers. Yes. You know, I was just oh, yeah. having a conversation with uh, uh, one of my TAs, teacher assistants, and you know, I wasn't around at that time, but I remember seeing movies and documentaries about Robert Hoover, who, yeah. when he did the CIA or FBI, I can't remember which agency, he used to have the little agents and they used to promote, you know, little CIA people and you'd get little box, you know, their little mm -hmm. top box, you get a little badge. Yep. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, that's where uh, the Boy Scouts started. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about being a good citizen yeah. At that time, I really believe we need to do that with cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. We need to start introducing cybersecurity, uh, what we call uh, white hats or, you know, uh, blue hats to the younger age so that they want to become a protector of virtual yeah. world because that's where they're living now. Yes, and so sure. uh, we need to introduce that at a lower. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, developing some type of uh, acumen at a, uh, you know, middle school age. Um, type level. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up today, that, that leads into my, my last question here. Where do you see cybersecurity education going in, in the years to come? With more time currently being spent at home with laptops and good Wi-Fi. Uh, do you think, do you see career learning changing demonstrably over the next decade? 
Well, you know, we actually get paid to be uh, in the predicting. They call it predictive analysis. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, to be honest, with this pandemic, I, I'm going to tell you, I really don't know where it's going to land. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know, honestly, where, you know, it's so there's a lot of gray area. There's a yes. lot of cloud around the immediate. I think yeah. long term, you know, we all know that eventually with, you know, uh, people going out to space and, you know, that's you know, the Jetsons <laughs> life world is eventually, <laughs> right. you know, in the rising. Right. Yeah. But in the, in the short term, um, I, I really, I can only tell you what I hope. I, mm -hmm. I hope that, um, you know, that we will be in physical domain, uh, that there yes. will be, you know, cause you can't lose that physical touch that, you I know, agree. that eye to eye. Um, but I think it'll be more of a semi hybrid mode where you have virtual, mm -hmm. it built in with, with physical, maybe two thirds vertical, physical, a third, virtual that's kind of my ideal spot mm -hmm. um because right now today we're more like 97 70 to 90 percent virtual yes. and then you know 30 to 10 percent you know physical um in the in the corporate and education world uh but again semi-hybrid that's where i would love uh to, for it to land yeah uh so one one last question here if our listeners want to learn more about cicero chimbanda and maybe even take his classes where can they go online so uh, I, I think LinkedIn is always a good one. You can search. Um, it's unique name, Cicero Chimbanda. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good way to learn about myself. I do also have, you know, if you Google Cicero Chimbanda InfoSec training, it'll come up with some of the courses that I teach uh, in the different domains. Uh, so I would say those are the two ways of uh, picking me up. Uh, Cicero, thank you so much for your time and insights today. It was really great talking. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Uh, and as always, thank you to everyone who is listening to our podcast at home or listening at work or listening at work from home. New episodes of the Cyborg Podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central, both on video at our YouTube page and on audio wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. I'm also excited to announce that our InfoSec Skills platform, which Cicero is on, of course, will be releasing a new challenge every month with three hands-on labs to put your cyber skills to the test. Each month, you'll build new skills ranging from secure coding to penetration testing to advanced persistent threats and everything in between. Plus, we're giving away more than $1,000 worth of prizes each month. So go to infosecinstitute.com slash challenge and get started right now. Thank you once again to Cicero Chimbanda and thank you all so much for watching and listening. We will speak to you next week. Mm -hmm.